Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to Bro Watch 2024. This is not to be confused with the greatest TV show in the history of the world. This is not Baywatch. Rather, this is Bro Watch, a series of videos in which I respond to brotivational speakers who are served up to me by the YouTube algorithm. I promise, I don't go looking for these guys. <laughs> but if, in their brotivational way, they have a channel where they're usually talking about pull-ups or getting up at 4.30 in the morning or drinking black coffee or whatever, and they decide to make a video about books or reading, because I've made 7,000 books about, uh, 7,000 videos about books and reading, the algorithm will often serve me those videos up. And when it does, I watch them. And sometimes I contemplate whether or not they're worthy of the bro watch treatment. I haven't done a bro watch video in quite some time. And I thought when this latest video was served up to me that maybe I might be a little rusty. Uh, the video is called How to Become a Better Reader, and it's from a channel called The Active Mind. Uh, and I'll leave a link uh, down below, because I, I watched the video, and then I watched it again in a bit of confusion. Maybe I have grown a little rusty. Maybe I'm not doing enough Bro Watch videos, because, well, I went into the video looking right away to see if any of the telltale signs were there. And there were a ton of them, <laughs> just a ton of them. Is the videographer uh, an attractive young man? Yes. Uh, are there statues in the background of guys with beards? Capital G, capital B, guys with beards. Yes. Is there a very visible copy of David Foster Wallace's crap novel, the Inf An Infinite Jest? Yeah, there is. Uh, is the background in very artful, soft focus? Yes. Uh, does the, the, the young guy in the video casually toss around terms like reality or consciousness or things like that? Yes, absolutely. Is there subtly self-flattering B-roll footage? Yeah, lots and lots of it. Does the, the young presenter have gnarly tattoos? Uh, yes. <laughs> in this case, yes, very much so. Uh, is it fairly obvious that the presenter in the video, uh, certainly has never read a book written by a woman and maybe isn't completely convinced that women are human. I got that impression. I think you'll get that impression too. And most of all, right there, knocking you over the head, is the presenter wearing the signature black, chunky, ostentatious cow crap ring? The signal of a brotivational grifter. Yes, it's yes to all of those. It checked all those boxes. I was watching the video and I was thinking that I was starting to salivate, thinking, oh, I found my latest victim. It wasn't, I didn't go out searching. I'm not picking on anybody. The YouTube algorithm served it up for me because he talked about better ways to read. But I was noticing other things while I was watching this video. And they were a little disturbing to me. And I bet they'll be disturbing to you as well if you watch the video. Like, for instance, does the young presenter seem to believe what he's saying? Yes. All throughout the video, he seems to believe what he's saying. Also, does the young presenter talk like an android? All motivational speakers talk like androids. So they don't say getting down to cases. They said get, getting down to cases. How is it going? How is it going, guys? What is up, guys? Not what's up. Not the way you greet a friend. What's up? What is up? Or uh, we're going to look at this in depth. No, we're going to look at this in depth. To, they're talking like the, the bored flight attendant who's giving you the instructions on what to do if your plane goes down. And they sound bored and exactly even in their tone. No, in, no human inflections, no human intonations in their speech. Because they're under the mistaken impression that if they talk that way, you will pay more attention. That's not true. The opposite is actually true. People li less, listen less to androids than they do to people who are stressing where ordinary human stress goes in spoken English. But they're also saying that because they've said it a million times. And motivational speakers like to, to talk that way because on one level, maybe not conscious, they want to stress to you that they're, they're really kind of bored with what they're saying. They just want your money. But also, is this young presenter asking for money? No, not at any point in his video is he asking for money. That was also a little, a little weird thing. And perhaps the weirdest thing of all, the counterbalance to the cow crap ring, was his advice in his video good? And... Yes, it is. I thought we'd go over his pointers for how to be a better reader and see what we make of them before we get to what I'm sure will be a bewildered conclusion. <laughs> so his point number one, his tip number one on how to make yourself a better reader is to create a designated reading space and maybe even a designated reading time if your schedule will allow it. And uh, 
I'm not that kind of reader. I'm the kind of, as some of you can attest in person, when I fall into a book, I can fall into it anywhere. A bomb could go off next to me and I wouldn't know. People have to wave their hand in front of my face to get my attention, even when I'm out waiting for them, when we've arranged a designated meeting. I don't need a designated place or a designated time. But it is a natural human thing to want those things, and that will definitely strengthen your reading habit, if you have such a thing. Uh, an active mind, he goes out of his way to be, to be, you know, gentle on this point, because he knows that people have different schedules, different personal realities, different lifetimes, home environments, and whatnot. I would stress more than he would that uh, the time is also important, that making a time is also important, especially if your time is not your own. And there, making a special designated time to read would not only be important for you, but I would say it would also be important to make sure that everyone else around you knows that as well. That can help a lot. Uh, so his first tip for being a better reader was good. His second tip was to vary your reading pace. So, uh, you know, if you're hitting deep waters in a book, if you're hitting a book that demands extra time, then don't worry about your reading goal on Goodreads or anything like that. He refers to them as vanity metrics. That's a wonderful phrase. We should all be on guard against vanity metrics. Uh, maybe not metrics, but vanity metrics, definitely. So if, if, you're, if you hit a book, you just finished a book and you're really glad, you're really good, you're liking the clip you're going at for this month, and you hit another book and right away you get the sense, uh, this is going to be a slow read. His advice here in this second tip, which is excellent advice, is to go with that. Don't impose an outside standard on it. L let that book vary your reading taste, your reading pace. Uh, then his tip number three is to take notes on your book. He even suggests a, a really wonderful thing that I've never seen in any other video, which is maybe try writing out paraphrases of what you've read. Try, try actually figuring out what it is that you've read. Break it down for your own use. But certainly taking notes. Uh, however you do that, whether it's tabs or uh, actually annotating the book or a commonplace book or whatnot, this is excellent advice. Try to be a better reader. Not necessarily notice, he's not saying this will make you a faster reader, and neither am I, but it will definitely make you a better reader. The more involved you get with the stuff you're reading, unless you're sailing through something very shallow just for fun. I do plenty of that. I know plenty of people who do plenty of that. I know some readers who do nothing but that, and good for them. If you're sailing through something that's just for fun, you obviously don't need to keep a commonplace book or, or engage with the notes. But if you're reading something that's got a little more grain in its wood, this is an excellent tip. This will this will definitely help you to, to master that thing better and, and enjoy it more. Uh, then tip number four is uh, read hard books. And here at this tip, when he said this, my hopes revived. I was thinking, all right, surely... This young guy is now going to vary into bro watch territory. Surely he's going to start now to go on and on about what constitutes a hard book. He's got the guys with beards bus in the background. He's got David Foster Wallace's crap book in the background. Surely now is when he's going to give me red meat. But no, <laughs> no, no, he's simply reflecting the fact, which is true, that some books are harder than others and that the hard books are worthwhile. A lot of them are. I would point out here what I've pointed out my whole life, which is that a lot of hard books are hard only because they're bad. But, nevertheless, there are a lot of hard books out there that are hard and brilliant. And maybe, if you want, you shouldn't shy away from them. And here he makes, and he has some excellent follow-up ideas about what to do with that. He wants to point out, essentially, that when you are encountering a hard book and trying to read it, you're not on your own. You can, as he puts it, leverage all the tools of the internet. There'll be lectures online. There'll be read-alongs or buddy reads or whatnot. There's this channel and plenty of other channels like it. There'll be all sorts of things to help you here. And that is wonderful. That is an, a very good tip. Don't think that that is weakness at all. That, don't, don't think that, you know, I should be able to get this on my own. No. Seek out as much help as you want. Go over it. Take as long as you want. Uh, link it to the previous tip about varying your reading pace. Take as long as you want. Uh, then, uh... His next tip is connected to, that, to the, the part about leveraging not only the internet, but anywhere else for help. His next tip is to use a dictionary. <laughs> and he is uh, he, he's rather charmingly in favor of print dictionaries. And the reason why, even, print dictionaries are a thing of the past. They sell for a dollar at the Brattle Bookshop. But his reason why is refreshingly honest. He says he knows, his, he knows himself. He knows his own habits. And he knows that if he looks something up on his phone, he could easily find himself two hours later looking at videos on Instagram of people 
diving headfirst into swimming pools where they thought the ice was thin. But actually, the ice is really thick, and they blast off it like a splattered pizza, and you laugh because you're a horrible person, or cat videos, or whatever. That is absolutely true. That is the world we live in. And some print dictionaries are works of art on their own. I allow me here to give a, a plug to the fourth edition of the American Heritage Dictionary in a big hardcover. Every time I see it for a dollar at the Brattle sale lot of my bookstore, I think I should get that because it's so beautifully done. It's so caringly done. But I would never use a print dictionary. You will know yourself whether or not you need that. I just thought it was really charming that he uses that as a, as a tip. Use a dictionary. Learn about the stuff that's stumping you. Don't just put it off. Again, this would, in any other contest, this might fly in the face of some of my own advice on how to be a better reader. Usually, in a context like this, I would say the opposite. I would say if you're reading along and you're getting what you're reading and you encounter a phrase or a term or something like that that you don't get, don't break the spell. Just keep going. Get it from context and just keep going. Maybe, for some of you, this will be a more rewarding ex exercise. Have a dictionary. What a wonderful idea. Have a print dictionary near you. I've never heard that as a tip for being a better reader. There's no arguing with that it would work. It would certainly work, but I've never heard anyone say it. And if I've never heard anyone say that, and I found it charming, that's nothing compared to his final tip, which is to write book reviews. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it when he said it. Write book reviews of what you've read to help you with it, to help you be a better reader. And he describes it. He describes how awkward it is. You're flying through a book, maybe because you're under the, the heel of those vanity metrics, you're flying through a book, and you finish it, and you someone says, oh, that's, tell me about it, and you can't do it. Because you haven't nailed down your thoughts on the subject. A, re a book review will certainly be a way to do that. All sorts of venues now, it doesn't have to be a vanity exercise in a private notebook. You can put your reviews on Goodreads so that you can access them more easily. Other people can see them. You can put them on Amazon. Uh, and there are plenty of online venues where you can submit them for a bigger audience than that. Uh, it's an excellent, excellent idea. I wouldn't have thought that someone who doesn't review books professionally would recognize that reviewing books is a way to become a better reader. It, it indisputably is, but I, the only people I've ever heard make that point were reviewers. <laughs> I've, never, I've never seen someone who wasn't a reviewer do that. So, <laughs> what can I say? I totally agree with all of these tips for being a better reader. They're all really good tips. Despite the cow crap ring, despite the guys with beards in marble busts in the background, despite the, the soft focus, despite the self-worshipping B-roll footage, despite all of that, these are really good tips. Indisputably, they're indisputably bro-tube tips. I, 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 my instincts can't be wrong. I doubt this kid has ever read a book by a woman. I'd be I'd be willing to, be, to believe that he's a little he'd be a little bit surprised that women can write books. <laughs> so he, he he's definitely in the BroTube community. I I understand. There's no mistake that the algorithm served his video up to me, but I got the impression that he believed what he was saying. He was saying what he was saying as a human being instead of an android, and what he was saying was all right. It was all completely right. So my return to Bro Watch is a little bit unsettling <laughs> because at the end of a Bro Watch video, ordinarily when the corpse has stopped twitching and I have spaded it over the last bit of dirt uh, and tamped it down, I am giving you rounding advice about avoiding this person like the bubonic plague. Only now at the end of a Bro Watch video, I'm finished analyzing the video and I'm saying maybe you should go and subscribe <laughs> to an active mind. What has become of Bro Watch? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, but I had to make a video. I mean, <laughs> it can't all be easy. We will see what the algorithm serves up to me next time. But this time, well, this is one for the Bro Watch annals. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this up for now. I will leave a link to this guy's channel. I bet you will enjoy it. <laughs> I've never heard that in a Bro Watch video before. <laughs> Uh, but we'll see. Maybe I can uh, can shed blood and spill viscera next time. <laughs> so I'll wrap this up for now, and I'll see you all then. Thank you, BookTube. <laughs>